We're lucky to have uh, Bobby Ross here tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read this so I don't miss anything. There's a lot to say about Coach Ross, um, so I can't cover everything. I'll cover the big points. But, you know, I'll start with, these are the NCAA programs he's been the head coach of in his career as a football coach. Uh, he has led the Citadel, University of Maryland, Georgia Tech, Army, and at the NFL level, he's been the head coach of the San Diego Chargers and the Detroit Lions. Uh, some of his highlights, and there's numerous that I know he's proud of, but in 1990, he led Georgia Tech to the National <coughs> Championship, and in 1994, he led the San Diego Chargers to the Super Bowl. He also has won four ACC championships in his career. He's received the Bobby Dodd Coach of the Year, the Paul Bear Bryant Coach of the Year, the Sporty News Coach of the Year, the Walter Camp Coach of the Year, the Eddie Robinson Coach of the Year, and the AFCA Coach of the Year. He's also been inducted into numerous Hall of Fames, in court, including the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame and the San Diego Chargers Hall of Fame. Coach and his wife have three sons, two daughters, and 18 grandchildren, some who are here in Lexington. Um, we you help me welcome Coach Bob Ross. Nice job. I wasn't in, uh, expecting such a big introduction, okay? I, I thought maybe I died with all those nice things you were saying about me, but, uh, but uh, thanks for not mentioning the score of the Super Bowl, okay? <laughs> we played the 49ers, and it wasn't a good score, okay? But the longest day of my life, <laughs> perhaps the longest day of my life. But uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and be with you. Uh, I, I actually spoke at a similar program to this, up at Amherst uh, College, up in uh, Massachusetts. And, uh, and it was almost the exact replica of what y'all are doing here right now. Uh, so in some respects, I'm gonna say some of the things that I said at Amherst, not realizing that there was a connection between what y'all had done. Now, I, I went to school right next door, okay? Uh, Virginia Military Institute. When I was there, we were known as Virginia's Marching Idiots, okay? We did a lot of marching, okay? A lot of marching. And uh, I can still remember walking past from the movie theater on a Saturday night and looking up there and the guys are having a heck of a time in that fraternity house and I'm going back to that god-awful barracks back over there, man. <laughs> and it was, I was very envious, I'll have to tell you. I was very envious. Uh, but I, I came to VMI because it was a small school and it's about the only one that would accept me, really, to tell you the truth. And uh, really enjoyed it. Got, I mean, I don't know if I enjoyed it, but I'm glad I got the degree out of it. And uh, it was very, very meaningful for me and helped me in a lot of ways. I spent, my wife and I are on our 55th year of marriage. We've been married 54 and a half years, and we will celebrate our 55th on uh, June 13th of 2014. 18 grandchildren, one was deceased. Uh, we lost a little granddaughter uh, in 1988 uh, through a heart transplant. Uh, she was born to my oldest son, and uh, she came, uh, he called me, I was actually recruiting. I, I still remember the day very well, everything about it I remember, but uh, I remember I was down there right across, I was at a high school coach, right across the street from a Daytona 500, and I was recruiting for Georgia Tech. And uh, my son called and said, Dad, we got a daughter, eight pounds, seven and a half ounces. And I said, boy, that's great, fantastic. Next day, he calls me, he's crying like a baby. He was an airport, uh, Air Force pilot, and he was in England. He said, you and Mom got to come over right away, and we did. And we had to make a decision. We had three choices. We could take her home and let her die. We could uh, give her something temporary that would keep her alive for a month or so or we could go for a heart transplant. So we walked around the hospital, my son and I, that night. I still remember saying, Chris, we gotta go for it. You know, we gotta go for it, and we did. And then you gotta get accepted, and we got accepted uh, to a hospital out in California called uh, Loma Linda, California. And they were the only ones that were really doing infant transplants at that time, and uh, that's what she needed. Uh, she got the heart of a little boy who had died of sudden infant death syndrome. We never knew his name. Uh, although we did know his first name was Chris, and, and uh, Chris was my son, so I felt like that was a good sign. Uh, she lived 15 months and then uh, passed away in my son's arms. But uh, it was, we still count her. She's very, very special to us and always will be. Her name was Rebecca, and we never forget Rebecca. She's very, very special. Now, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about tonight is, is uh, the things that I think are so important in leadership 
but also principles that are of life that are important in building a football team, building a family, building a corporation, whatever it may be. To me, if you don't have the things that we're going to talk about, you're going to fight for success. You'll have a hard time with it. Uh, I spent 43 years in coaching. And the thing that I'm probably the most proud of in my coaching career, I spent three years in the United States Army, but 43 years in coaching. And the thing that I'm most proud of is that I might be one of the few guys in all of coaching who has been an assistant and a head coach at every level, high school, college, and, and uh, professional ranks. I was an assistant uh, uh, with the Kansas City Chiefs in the National Football League. Uh, I was an assistant at uh, the University of Maryland for a period of time. I assisted right over here at VMI uh, for two years. And then I was an assistant at the College of William & Mary for four years. Uh, we played more like Mary than we did William while I was there, so we, <laughs> I kind of got out of it after that. I also assisted at Rice University for one year. What a wonderful school that was too, very similar to what you would be academically. You can't believe it, but Rice University has about 25 undergraduate students, 2,500, excuse me, 25 under, under, 100 undergraduate students and they have a stadium that seats about 78,000 people. It's remarkable, but a tremendous and a, and a very, very good program. But you know, to read a little bit of this, it says, you know, my, I'm a 59 graduate, so you, if you're quick on your mathematics, you'll know how old I am. I played three sports at VMI, okay, very, uh, three sports. Uh, my first experience in football at VMI was we were going down to play the Tulane Green Wave in 1955, and I was a freshman. And I was, boy, I, you know, I, I, I didn't have any idea I'd even make a trip. We went down in three, I don't know, B-25s or something, but they were old planes, I guarantee you. And I was on the third team and, and the third plane. Actually, I was a fifth team quarterback. Never even wondered why I was going down there. And I was, you know, I was excited. Uh, we flew down. I had never been in an airplane. Lord, I had never driven, been in a car. Uh, my father lived to be 92 years of age. And we never had an automobile. We never, he never drove a car. Never. In his entire life. We never had television. Never. So here we are, flying into Tulane Green Wave, and we go out, we work out on the Sugar Bowl, which was, I've never seen anything like it. It was like a golf green. To this day, to this day, in all the games that I've coached in, it was the best field I've ever seen. It was absolutely the best field I've ever seen. It was like a golf green. And, and so I'm enamored with all this. We go back. I go to my room, and I'm turning on television. I watch television. It was still black and white in those days, okay, but it was television. And I'm sitting there and there. I'm thinking I've arrived. The next day we go out. We're getting ready to play the ball game. There's about 55,000 people in the Sugar Bowl, okay. Now, the Sugar Bowl was on the campus at the, univer at the Tulane University. And it seated about 85,000 people. So I'm awestruck. You know, I mean, I'm just excited as all get out. I'm not going to play. I don't think I'm going to play anyway. So we get on the bench, and we get into the game, and we're losing something like 21 to 7. And uh, I, I'm sitting next to a guy named George O'Neill, who uh, was from Silesian High School up in Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, George was a chemistry major. And uh, he had snuck a bag of hard-shelled peanuts onto the bench, okay? So we're sitting there eating peanuts, all right? And in those days, we had these long sleeve jerseys, all right? And, and it was an absolute no-no. You didn't roll those things up, okay? Uh, but I had rolled mine up because in those days, VMI was all male, okay? And I hadn't seen a girl in a month. So I noticed this real pretty blonde-haired cheerleader from Tulane behind me. You know, so I've got this, we had these benches with the big backrest, so I rolled my sleeves up to show them my guns, you know. <laughs> well, well, I didn't have any guns, okay, I really didn't. So I kind of flattened my arms up on the back like that, you know, and just kind of smashed them down to make my arms look big. And we're getting there, eating the hard shell peanuts, and, and getting a suntan, okay. So I'm just relaxing, enjoying peanuts, suntan, checking out the women. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, my coach calls my name. Now, my coach was my mentor, okay? And, and to this day, I think he had more to do with anything in my success in my life other than my wife than, than anybody I ever was around. That was a fellow by the name of John McKenna. And he calls out my name. 
Ross, like that. Now, you know, if you've ever been on a bench like that and you hear that name, I mean, your heart starts pounding, okay? I mean, it just starts beating. And all of a sudden, I realized I didn't know where my helmet was. Now, if y'all remember, there was a guy named Thurman Thomas who played for the Buffalo Bills, and Thurman Thomas drew a lot of criticism because in the first Super Bowl he ever played in, he missed the first two plays of the game because he couldn't find his headgear, okay? <coughs> I was the second guy to have that happen to, okay? Although I wasn't in the Super Bowl. So I'm looking around, I said, I'm up and down the bench. Anybody got a size seven? Anybody got a size seven? Guy shoots me a size seven, I put it on. I go shooting up there next to Coach McKenna. Now in those days, you had a single bar. You had to decide, were you gonna protect your nose or were you gonna protect your teeth? Now, some of you are smiling, y'all. I figure y'all must have known what I chose to protect my teeth, right? Because my nose is a little bit big, okay? So I'm standing there next to John McKenna, and I'm rolling down my sleeves. I got a few peanut shells on my thing, <laughs> jersey, and I'm getting these off my jersey like that, rolling down the sleeves, and I'm not paying a bit of attention to what Coach McKenna is saying to a guy named Tom Dooley. Now, Tom Dooley later officiated in the NFL and got the Golden Whistle Award, which is a, a big-time award as an official in the National Football League. Well, anyway, I'm up there, and, uh, and I can just envision... I was from Richmond, Virginia, and I've been envisioning all of my family sitting around the radio, listening to the game. And I can just, you know how your imagination gets carried away, and I'm thinking, and there's Bob Ross, number 11, standing next to John McKenna, ready to go into the game. WLEE, -E, radio station, Richmond, Virginia, Bob Gilmore, the voice of the VMI key that's at that time. So I'm thinking, man, this is big time, you know, I'm excited. And I'm saying, my dad's probably saying, hey, listen up, Bobby's going into the game, he's going into the game. I'm all excited. I haven't paid a bit of attention to what they're talking about. Coach says, Ross, like that. I said, yeah, coach, yeah, waiting for play, formation, all of this stuff, you know. Although, although, I was the fifth team quarterback. I don't know why I was even up there, okay. All of a sudden, he looks at me and he says, what size shoe you wear, boy? I said, what'd you say, coach? All the wind kind of left the sail, okay? It just left, They're totally and completely. I said, what'd you say? He said, what size shoe you wear? I said, I wear a nine and a half. He says, take off your right shoe and give it to Tom. So I want you to know my right shoe played in the Sugar Bowl, okay? <laughs> that's as far as it got. The, now, so that's my football ability. My basketball ability, y'all would never know this, but in actuality, I really did. I once got at Hot Rod Hunley out of West Virginia, All-American. Now, Hot Rod was a great, great player, okay? You ever heard of Jerry West, a great player for the Lakers for years? Hot Rod was the All-American at West Virginia before him. I held Hot Rod to 44 points and a half, okay? <laughs> I never played basketball again after that game. Got out of it. The one good thing is it only took me two, year, two terms to graduate, Truman and Eisenhower, okay? And uh, that was the length of time that I was there. Uh, coaching in pro football, I learned something about pro football when I went with Coach uh, Levy to the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, it's big time business, okay? And Kansas City had come to Kansas City by way of what they call the Red Coders. 101 Red Coders or Red peop or people who had contributed the money to bring the Kansas City Chiefs to Kansas City. That's how the money, they provided all the money. So when you would take the field, you would run through the red coaters, okay? And they were all lined up. I mean, they'd line right up and we'd run right through them. You know, 101 of them. All the time, they wear these red jackets. Uh, the woman, uh, there was a woman there with a white uh, blouse or skirt and then a yellow scarf. Actually, they were the same colors as VMI at the time. And, and I was, you know, I'm running through them. We're, we're playing the Oakland Raiders. And uh, Oakland was our big rival. And they were awfully good, awfully good. Uh, you wouldn't recognize some of the names, but the Stork, they called the Stork. Matuzak, I mean, he looked like a wrestler. I mean, he's about 6'8", I don't know, big. Anyway, we're losing 24 to 3 at half. So I'm running in to, to get in there, and, you know, we got to sit down and talk about things because we're behind by a good margin. So as I do, I kind of inadvertently bumped into this elderly woman, you know, with her her red jacket, her white skirt, and her yellow scarf. 
She was an elderly woman, and I said, no offense, ma'am, and she says, you're damn right, no defense either. So I learned an awful lot from those right then and there what that was like, okay? Let's get to a couple of things what we really want to talk about. That's this, you know, when I first started coaching, I was looking for things to read and find out things about people and et cetera and so on and so forth. And I came across a thing that was said by the late, great George Allen. Now, you would probably not uh, recognize the name, but he was a Redskin coach for years. And actually, his son is, uh, is the uh, general manager for the Washington Redskins right now. His other son was the governor of the state of Virginia for a period of time. But he was known for his coaching ability, and he did a wonderful job. And he also, and I, after four, following through 43 years of it, the one thing that still stuck in my mind about what he said was this. Character, said Alan. Character is the most important quality to look for in a person. The dictionary defines it as moral strength, self-discipline, fortitude. Without character, there is a tendency to do what is necessary to get you by, to be distracted easily, to cheat not only yourself, but those around you. In coaching, we recognize character as distinguishing between a winner and a loser. Every year at the beginning of the season, we would sit down and we would look at our winner category and we would put on the board every player and we would put a W behind them and if we didn't know, very seldom would we categorize the guy as a loser. We'd put a question mark there. But you're looking for winners or leaders, whatever the case. To me, they're almost synonymous, okay? And you're looking for a winner or, or a leader as opposed to a leader. A loser. It says this, a winner is always a part of the answer, a loser is always a part of the problem. A winner is, always has a program, a loser always has an excuse. A winner says, let me do it for you. A loser says, that's not my job. A winner sees an answer for every problem, a loser sees a problem for every answer. A winner says it may be difficult, but it's possible. A loser says it may be possible, but it's too difficult. A winner defines or crystallizes his goals. I remember one of the first things in my coaching as a head coach at the Citadel, and that was in Charleston, South Carolina. We went down to St. Mary's County in, in, uh, in the southeastern most part of the state of Georgia. And it's a very rural area, very rural area. And we were recruiting this running back. Uh, his name was Stump Mitchell, okay? Now, you may or may not recognize the name. Stump Mitchell was about, he got the name Stump. He was about five feet, eight inches tall. He weighed about 185 pounds. And he had a body fat content of about 1%. I mean, he was put together. So they called him Stump, built like a tree stump. When I went into his home, okay, there was no front door. The only thing that was hanging down was a blanket on that door. Where the door was, there was a blanket hung down. And we went out and we recruited stuff. There weren't many that were after him, okay? But we saw him, really liked him. And, and we brought him into to, uh, to, uh, the Citadel. Now, when I first started as a head coach, and I followed this throughout everywhere I ever went, I would ask our people to fill out a sheet for me and list four goals. I wanted them to tell me what they wanted to do academically. Did they have in mind what they wanted to do job-wise? Did they know what they wanted to do? What did they want to do as individually as a player? And what did they want our team to accomplish? So when I was reviewing the notes, Stump was now at the Citadel. It's a military school, very similar to VMI. And he was going through all the indoctrination and uh, harassment to some extent, okay? And it's about 10 o'clock at night, and I'm checking these golds. And Stump only has two golds. I look on his sheet, he only listed two golds. He said he wanted to win the Heisman Trophy, and he wanted to win, uh, be a Dean's List student. Now, this is my first time of head coaching. I'm 35 years of age, and in all of my infinite wisdom, I think Stump's we uh, was uh, reaching too high, you know? He can't get it. So I, I sent for him right away. He was really happy because he got him out of some of that stuff. About 10.30 at night, and I make a 20-minute presentation to him. Stump. His real name was Livonia. Okay, so, and, uh, and I said, Stump, you know, you, 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 how are you going to win the Heisman Trophy at the Citadel? I mean, you've got people 
South Carolina, Clemson, all these big universities, Michigan, uh, everywhere, Michigan State, whatever the case, you know, big schools. You're not going to have a chance at that. And then I said, Dean's List student? Stop, you remember your transcript? I said, you just make straight D's right now. Stay eligible, okay? We'll get to the rest of the things later on. And I'm sitting there talking to him, and all of a sudden, he says, you finished, coach? And I said, yeah, I am. And with that, he stood up abruptly. I mean, real abruptly. To the point where I thought he was going to hit me. I threw my hands up in reflex like this, okay? He pointed at me like that, and he said, coach, your gold stay. They stay. I said, all right, Stump, okay. Well, Stump went on to have a great career. He told me as a freshman that he should be starting the whole time. First game he ever started was when we were playing VMI right down here on this field. He rushed for over 100 yards. and He played five games that had something like 600 yards rushing. But he became the player of the year in the state of South Carolina two out of the four years that he was in the, in the, in the, uh, in the state, in the program. Now, he also played against the University of South Carolina, whose running back that year was the Heisman Trophy winner, was a guy named George Rogers. And in that game, Stump actually outrushed George Rogers. He was that good of a player. Now, I had left, by his senior year, I had left, and I was at Kansas City. And I was in Mobile, Alabama, and Stump had been selected to play in the Senior Bowl, okay? So I'm down there to evaluate him, and I hadn't seen him in almost two years. So I, I, I went up to him after practice, I said, Stump, how about you and I going out to dinner tonight? He said, Coach, that'd be great, I'd love to do that. So we did, we went to some restaurant there in Mobile, Alabama, and we're sitting there chewing the fat and talking, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, Stump gets a little serious. And he says, uh, Coach, you remember those goals I sent? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. And I got a little bit of a dig into him. You know, I said, uh, now let me see. Uh, Rogers won that Heisman Trophy, didn't he? You didn't win that thing. He said, he got very serious. He said, I did get two, two votes. But then he got this real big grin on his face the size of a chessy cat. And I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you remember that other goal? I said, yeah. He said, I want you to know I became a Dean's List student. And he did. He became a Dean's List student. Now that guy taught me something about setting a goal. He really did. Because see, I'm thinking he's reaching too high and he's seeing himself as reaching higher. And the big thing is to reach high, to go for him, set him high. Set him a little bit above where you might think you want and go for it. He did, he became, he was a very successful player in the National Football League for 12 years. He later coached, he was the assistant head coach of the Washington Redskins. And right now he is an assistant coach with the Phoenix Cardinals in the National Football League. But he taught me something about setting the goal. And that's to reach beyond what, you, what you're capable of, or what you think you might be able to reach to. Winners are not afraid of hard work. You know, there's a little expression that goes like this. The good Lord gave me two ends with a common link. One is to sit on, and one is to think. Heads you win, tails you lose, okay? Tails you lose. If you don't work hard, you won't get there. I don't care what your athletic abilities might be, you've got to work hard, and don't be afraid to work hard. I used to tell our, our, our squad, look, I'm your albatross, I'm holding you down, but you gotta overcome me by being a good worker. And we can outwork people, and we intend to do that. Winners can take the blame. You know, that's one of the things that really bothers me. When I first went to coaching in Maryland in 1982, I had a pretty good quarterback. His name was Boomer Esiason. If you watch television on, on Sunday, you'll see him on one of those talk shows at the beginning of the Sunday show, you know. Heck of a quarterback. Very competitive. Six feet, four inches tall. Uh, and about 215 pounds, had the mentality of a, of a linebacker. And, and to this day, one of the really great people. He had a son who was born with cystic fibrosis. Boomer Esiason has raised probably over $60 million in support of cystic fibrosis. But at that time, he was our starting quarterback. He later went on, 
had a great career in the pros and played in the Super Bowl as well. He did a little bit better in his than I did in mine. But he's out there, and we're playing Penn State. It's the first game of the year. We're up at Penn State, 95,000 people in the stands, okay? And they're, they're all fired up, and, and, uh, and, and we're, we're heavy underdogs. But all of a sudden, we're winning the game. It's 24 to 23. So we're winning the game, and all of a sudden, we fumble the ball. Boomer comes off the field. And in all my calm demeanor, I said, what in the blankety blank are you doing fumbling the ball? He says, my fault. Pointed to his finger like that, he said, it's my fault. Well, I said, well, don't let it happen again, you know. Okay, coach. When I got to pro football, I was coaching a guy in pro football. Had all of the same talents. Big guy, strong, great arm, intelligent, you know, all of the things. He had everything. He had everything. He was lacking one thing. He was a finger pointer. He wanted to point the finger of blame, okay? So I called him in one day. I said, there's one thing that's preventing you from really being very, very successful. And I said, you know, and this is after I'd gotten to know his personality, et cetera. And I said, you know, you've got to learn to, to accept the blame. And I said, you actually have to take the blame. It may not even be your fault, but you take the blame. I said, and you'll win our squad over. They'll respect you more for that. They'll feel better about you as their leader. You understand? We went through it, 20 minutes. He said, yeah, coach, I buy that. I, I know what you're talking about. We go out on the practice field. We're practicing toward the end of practice. We're doing teamwork. And all of a sudden, our quarterback fumbles the ball from center. So the light bulb goes on, okay? I'm saying, aha, this is a chance for me to make a point. So I'm going to do it and, and help him with our squad. So I said, so-and-so, what in the world are you doing fumbling the ball from center? You know, we don't do that in the National Football League. I said, what happened? He looked at our center and he said it was his fault. Just like that. True story. You know, I cut him. As talented as he was, I just didn't feel like he knew how to take us to that next level with his leadership, with what he had as a leader, what we needed. And I think, you know, he was missing it. But that was an experience and a true experience. I think this, that uh, uh, you, learn, you need to learn how to take the blame. Even if it's not your fault, take the blame. Winners persevere. Okay, they can handle things that setbacks and it'll happen in your life. This is a little thing I used to read to a squad before the year began every year. And it didn't matter whether it was high school, college, or pro. And it says this, those who win. I once knew a man who would figure and plan the deeds he intended to do. But when the time came to get in the game, he never put anything through. He would dream with a smile of the after while and the deed he would do pretty soon. He was all right at heart, but he never would start. He never could get quite in tune. If he would have done half the things he'd begun, he'd be listed among those of fame. But he didn't produce, so he was of no use. Good intentions do not win the game. It is easy to dream and to plan and to scheme and to let them drop out of sight. But the men that put through what their dreams bring to view are the men who went out in the fight. Winners have determination. They are physically and mentally tough. Physically and mentally tough. I go back to my time at, at the Citadel. In my first year there, actually it was his second year, we had another great running back. The boy's name was Andrew Johnson. This was in the era of the O.J. Simpson. We used to call him A.J. Okay, great, great player, really was. He was a, uh, an African-American, and if you've ever been, any of you in here from Savannah? Anybody here from Savannah, Georgia? Okay, uh, you may know where I'm talking about, but underneath that bridge on Route 17 is some government housing, you know what I'm talking about? And, and it's poor, it's very, very poor. And Andrew had lived there, he was living there. And he was one of four, five children, and his mother. When I first got to the Citadel, excuse me, he, I had him, he and Stump, uh, Stump came after Andrew. When I first got to the Citadel, Andrew came into my, almost, uh, to my office almost immediately. 
He introduced himself, and then he said, Coach, I'd like to, uh, I have to go home. I said, what's the problem? What's the problem? He said, my mother's died, and I've got to get home and bury my mother. So I said, well, by all means, you go. You know, you got a way down there? Yes, sir, I do, so on and so forth. And I broke a rule on this one, and I'll tell you how it came about. And then, uh, so he goes home. And it's about eight, nine days, okay? And I haven't heard from Andrew. I haven't heard from him. So I, I, I call. You know, we didn't have cell phones in those days or anything of that nature. He didn't have a phone. So I didn't know that at the time. Because I'd only been there like a week to ten days myself. So I got an alumnus to go by the house and to see him. And uh, he knew him because he had probably helped Andrew in the process of coming to the Citadel. So he said, Coach, you won't believe this. He said, but his mother is laid out in the apartment where they live. And he hasn't been able to get the money together to bury her. And she's right there. I said, my God, you know, I mean, we got to do something. So I, I said, you know anybody down there, Citadel alumnus, who take care of it? That's breaking a rule. Okay, it's breaking a rule. But I broke it. He said, yeah, we'll take care of it. And we got his mother buried. And then he said, Coach, if you would, I said, Is there, I finally got him over the phone with this, with this gentleman. And I said, uh, he said, uh, Coach, uh, I said, everything all right, Andrew? He said, yes, sir. He said, yes, but I, he said, I don't have a coat to wear, you know, to, to the funeral. And I said, I'll bring you down my black blazer. And I did. I took it down to him. And he wore it for that. Now, this was the type of, he was in charge of that family. Okay, he was the oldest of all of them. And he was in charge of them. But you know what? He was a civil engineer. Now, I mean to tell you, I mean, you know, his coming from that environment and sticking to his goal of being a civil engineer was something very special. Took him about five and a half years to get a degree in civil engineering. But do you know he never stopped? He never stopped working and competing to do it. Another story about him is we're playing VMI right up here. And uh, we've, we've come up to play him. And we're staying at that Howard Johnson's out on Route 11. Y'all know where that is? Right out there. And Andrew is not playing. I, I'm bringing him along because he had torn his ACL. And he's our captain now. He's our captain. So he's in a cast. In those days, they'd put us in a big cast, okay? And he's in a cast, but he's making the trip with us. And we get there, and, and uh, we're watching, uh, I think, before, well, not before the game. Everybody's in their room, and I'm watching it. There's a Roanoke Station interviewing a tight end from VMI. And he is cockier than hell. And, I mean, he's saying some bad things about us, you know. So we go in there at the meal time, and I said, any of y'all see that uh, television uh, interview on that player from VMI? Every one of them raised their hand. I turned to one of our coaches and said, I'm not going to have to say a thing tonight. I mean, that guy already said it for us. So we talk about it, and, and it's, as, it's as high of an emotional level as I've ever had a team. It really was. I mean, they were emotionally into the game, really very much so. You know how them I will walk around the, the, uh, uh, the field, you know, marching in and all that kind of stuff? We broke their ranks. When we, brought, we took, finished the pregame warm-up, our guys were so fired up, they ran right through a company. Boy, did I get a few letters from VMI people when that happened, okay? And our phone calls, too. Well, anyway, but before that, before the warm-up, I'm up early the next morning, Saturday morning, and I look down the far end, and I see this guy going. Like that. I said, my God, that's Andrew. It's Andrew Johnson. It's a true story. I, I said, I ran down there. I said, where is your cast? Where is your cast? He said, Coach, I got in the tub and I soaked it off. He said, I think I can play today. I said, you, I made him sit right on the curb, right there on the curb. I said, you don't move. You don't move. I called our trainer out there and we took him to the hospital right here in town. And he got another cast put on him. <laughs> but he was that emotionally into the game. But he was such a competitor 
in everything that he did. And he didn't say a whole lot, but he led by example. And he led by example academically as well as athletically. Because the guy, you know, my Lord, he, to, to be a civil engineer, I used to have two engineers. I was a history major, okay? I had two engineers who were my roommates. And I used to kid them a lot because, you know, they engineers, they will brag a little bit. And they would say, you know, boy, that differential equation is giving me a hard time on, on my quantitative analysis and all that kind of stuff. I said, hey, you guys haven't seen a darn thing yet. I said, what are you talking about? I said, where do you get to that long division? You know, and they, they would never believe me on that one. But, but uh, that's the way, that was, uh, that was Andrew Johnson, a very, very special guy. Winners are not afraid to fail. Perhaps, uh, and, and, and listen to this, you're not afraid to fail. John Wooten, perhaps the greatest coach that ever lived in the history of coaching, once said this, don't permit fear of failure to prevent effort. Okay? We are all imperfect and will fail on occasion. But fear of failure is the greatest failure of all. Fear of failure is the greatest failure of all. Don't be afraid to go for it. Don't be afraid to take the chance. Listen to this guy. He lost a time or two. Lost his job 1821. Defeated for legislature 1832. Failed in business 1833. Elected to legislature 1834. Had his sweetheart die in 1835. Had a nervous breakdown in 1836. Defeated for the speaker in 1838. Defeated for nomination for Congress in 1843. Elected to Congress in 1846. Lost renomination 1847 or 46. Rejected for a land officer in 1849. Defeated for the Senate in 1854. And again defeated for the Senate in 1858. Guy lost a time or two. Anybody know who it was? Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Perhaps the greatest statesman of all time. Perhaps the greatest statesman of all time. And look at how many times he lost. How many times he faced adversity. And you have to come back from that. And leaders do. Winners or leaders build strong alliances. Trust is the essential building block for successful relationships. Trust. I mean, if you look at people. Can you trust them? That is the biggest key. That's the biggest question you could answer. Winners or leaders do not show pettiness, spite, or vengeance. They, that is considered to be the, beneath the dignity of a, of, a, of a leader, to show those things. Leaders or winners have faith and confidence in themselves. They don't need ego stroking. You must be ready to deal with harsh criticism and to accept blame. It is just as important to redirect the praise and the publicity. Keep your sense of humor and show grace under pressure. You will be scrutinized as a leader. Accept that responsibility. Leaders don't inflict pain, they bear it. And finally, we, leaders are, and winners are consistent and yet flexible. Keep the parachute open. Be a good listener. This is where I think so many times we all make a mistake. We don't listen first and foremost. I had a coach with me at Georgia Tech and later with the San Diego Chargers. And he was a very good coach, a very good coach, and a wonderful human being. Again, there's only one thing. He would always want to blurt out, okay, before we had gotten into a discussion. And I called him in, I said, Coach, you know, one of the things you gotta learn to do, and he was a young guy, okay? I said, one of the things you gotta learn to do is listen. You'll get your chance to speak, but listen. But don't go blurting out right away. Listen to what's being said. You may learn something from that, okay? So I think it's important that a leader is a good listener. I used to say, keep the parachute open. Many people hear the words, but they don't get the messages, simply because they're just waiting for their turn to talk. Listening takes concentration and interest in what the other person is saying. The mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work unless it is open to new ideas and direction. Winners and leaders stop are optimistic. They take a can-do approach. The glass is always half full. Winners make commitments, not contributions. You ever heard the story of the chicken and the pig? If you haven't, it goes like this. Winners, again, make commitments, not contributions. One day a chicken and a pig were traveling down a highway. 
They had been walking for several hours when they came upon a roadside diner. A flashing sign in front of the diner read, Breakfast served, bacon and eggs. And as they approached, the chicken became ecstatic upon seeing the sign. The pig inquired curiously, What is so exciting about a little neon sign beyond the promise of food? The chicken replied, It thrills my heart every time I see that sign. Millions of people will see a similar sign each day. And when they do, they will think of the two of us. The pig acknowledged that it was nice to be thought of, but then he observed, it is more difficult for me to share your enthusiasm. You see, for you, the sign represents only contribution, but for me, it represents total commitment because we get killed by the result of it. Whenever I used to talk to our squad, whenever we would take the field, wherever we went, I always asked for their commitment. And what that meant in my terms were you play from the bottom of your heels to the top of your head. I mean, that's your mind, your body, your soul, everything goes into it. You play to the extent where you have no effort left at all. You're exhausted. One of the greatest, actually the greatest player and the greatest effort player I ever had were one and the same. And his name was Junior Seau. And you may or you may not have known him. But he was a young man that uh, a year ago from this past spring, uh, he, he supposedly uh, was very despondent and depressed. He lived in San Diego and he had retired. He had played for 20 years in the National Football League. I had him for five of those years. And he was one heck of a player. The first day I ever coached him, we're out on the field and uh, I had just taken the head job at San Diego. And I had heard a lot about Junior, but I didn't know him. He had played at Southern California. He was a Samoan, okay? And boy, you talk about emotional. And six feet four, 255 pounds. We used to have a weigh-in every Thursday of the year, of the year, okay? And he never varied but one time in five years from being at 255 pounds. And he was at 251 pounds, and he'd had the flu. Every day, two, every time, 255 pounds. But in this particular practice, we're running past skeleton, which is just like they call seven on seven. And there's a long ball thrown downfield from there down this way. And Junior's a linebacker, and he turns, and he just looks. He just watches it, just watches the ball. So I'm trying to get him to play with great effort, okay? So all of us, all I said was, repeat the play. Say I loafed. And with that, he comes up and gets in my face. Now this guy, you look at how big I am, okay? And he's six feet four, 255 pounds. And this is my first year in pro coaching, okay? And he gets right in my face. He said, I didn't loaf, I didn't loaf. Very, very emotional guy. I said, yes, you did, Junior. And I said, right after practice, we're going to go in and I'm going to show you the play. So I'll be happy to do that. I know I didn't loaf. You know, I said, well, we'll do that. Well, he did loaf. I showed him the play. And after he looked at the play, he said, Coach, that'll never happen again. And it didn't. It didn't. He played with the greatest effort that I've ever had any player ever play with. But he also was perhaps the best player that I ever had in coaching. Tremendous effort player. Just a tremendous effort. Not only in the physical phases of it, but in the mental phases as well. Every day, early, to, early to look at film, etc. Winners do not try to bluff their subordinates. I once had a coach and he just come on us on board at San Diego and he tried to cut one of the players who was a real trickster, ask him a question, he's trying to get him frustrated, okay? And the guy tried to bluff him. He lost instant respect by losing him right then and there because he tried to bluff him. Don't bluff him. Okay, don't try to bluff. If you don't know something and you're in a leadership capacity, you just tell them you don't know. But don't try to bluff them. That's a terrible mistake. And you'll lose great credibility when something like that happens when they find out about it. When I was an Army officer in 1961, this was 1961, and I was with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and we had gotten orders that we were going overseas in 10 days. Okay? And uh, we were going to what we thought was war at the time. It was the Berlin crisis. 
And that was when the uh, Russian tanks and the American tanks confronted one another at the Berlin Wall. And we were going over as a unit. I was the executive officer of that unit. And my company commander was in a car accident during this time. We had two weeks to get ready to go. Two weeks. And we were sending all our whole unit overseas on a troop ship out of Baltimore, Maryland. And, I'm, I'm, and my company commander gets in the hospital. So I've got to take charge of the company. And I've got to move them all the way over. I called in every sergeant in that, in that unit right then and there. And I said, look, you know and I know that you know a lot more than I do. And I said, but we've got to succeed in making this move. We've got to get our unit ready. Greatest cooperation I ever had out of a group of men. They were wonderful. They were fantastic. But I wasn't going to try to bluff them, I'm going to tell you because I really didn't know. But they did know, and they got it done for us. So be careful and never try to bluff if you don't know the answer to it. There are two very important principles that I think are vital to building a relationship and thus building a foundation for any team organization or even a marriage, even a marriage, okay? In 1982, I was fortunate enough to become the head football coach at the University of Maryland. I succeeded a wonderful coach in man, Jerry Claiborne, who was a Hall of Fame man. He's dead now, deceased, but he was a Hall of Famer. When my practices started there, I would call up my players at the end of practice, and they would always begin this chant, the ring, the ring, the ring, the ring. And I said, well, first of all, I didn't understand what they were saying. I said, what, what are y'all chanting? They said, we're chanting the ring, coach. And I said, well, what is that symbolic of? So that's a conference championship. We want to win a conference championship. And they do it before every practice, every game. The ring, the ring, the ring. It was a symbol of a conference championship, and it could be given to the players upon a conference championship. We won the conference title that year, and when I sat down with a committee of players to design that ring, I indicated they earned the right to come up with a design for the ring, but I did want to include two words on that ring. Two words on that ring. And it was the foundation of our program. And it was the words trust on one side of the ring and respect on the other. Ultimately, trust leads to respect. But we had to have those things. And if we didn't, in anything that you do, organization, family, church, team, whatever it is, you better have trust and respect. You better have it. And it starts with trust, one another. Believing and trusting in one another. I'd like to read with you one final thing, and it goes like this. And it's titled Attitude. And it says this The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude in life. Attitude to me is more important than facts, it is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstance, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have. And that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% with what happens to me and 90% by how I react to it. And so it is with all of us. We are in charge of our attitudes. And keep that in mind as you go through school and right on in through, and perhaps you already have heard it and, and realized it and done it. But I think it's a very, very important little thing in life. Uh, I want to thank Coach for having me here. I really enjoyed being with you. Uh, I have great respect for you as students at WNL. I always have. I once read, and, and I, I was talking to Coach about it, where I once read where I think uh, in the law school that WNL has the highest percentage of judges in the history of any school or law school in the, in the country. Now, I don't know if we were talking about it. He said, I think what, that once would happen. I don't know if it still does or not. But you are a part of a great school and a great university. And I admire you for being here. And you are special. You are an elite. You are a winner. And you are a leader. 
and so it brings about added an additional responsibility. Uh, do I have time for a question or two, Coach? Sure. Any questions at all? None? Okay, you're going to let me off easy. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And good luck in school. Best of luck. And good on the exams when they come up. Okay? God bless. <laughs> Okay. Hey, if we could get the Leadership Academy just to say for just a minute. Uh, if you're not a part of the Leadership Academy, you're free to leave. If you want to stay with us, what we have to say to them, that's up to you. Have a good night. Okay. And if you want to ask uh, Coach a question, um, feel free to stay after and see him. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.